Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Library Association and Google's Hangout, revisiting the Children's Internet Protection Act 10 years later. ALA and Google brought together a group of experts from within the library community and from education, privacy, technology, research, and policy backgrounds to look back over the 10 years since the Supreme Court decision upholding SIPA. This Hangout will cover the, it will give an overview of the SIPA requirements, how libraries have and are implementing the requirements, and a summary of part of the symposium discussions that were held yesterday. We will start with Deborah Stone from the Office for Intellectual Freedom. And if you would like to participate, please use the Twitter hashtag SIPA underscore ALA13. And you can also use the chat feature in YouTube and Google+. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Deborah Caldwell Stone. Uh, I thought we'd start with some background information about the Children's Internet Protection Act um, and by looking at its history, in fact. Um, SEPA is just the end of a line of uh, legislation passed by Congress uh, to address concerns about children's access to sexually explicit content on the Internet. Uh, we began in the 1990s with the children, uh, the Communications Decency Act, which was a broad ban on indecent materials. Um, and then that was followed by the Children's Online Protection Act, which was a ban on the commercial publication of harmful to minors materials. Uh, CDA and COPA were both challenged in the Supreme Court, and they were permanently enjoined by the Supreme Court on First Amendment grounds. And these two cases give us two principles to look at. One is that the First Amendment applies without restriction to all material published on or provided through the Internet, and that direct restrictions on constitutionally protected speech intended to protect children from obscene content are unlikely to be found constitutional if the laws operate to restrict adults' access to protected speech. Now, the Children's Internet Protection Act was proposed in the wake of these decisions and responds to these decisions. Unlike the CDA and COPA, SEPA does not put the government in the business of directly regulating speech. Instead, it places conditions on schools and libraries' use of federal funds intended to subsidize Internet connections by requiring schools and libraries to employ technology to prevent users' access to illegal content. In practical terms, libraries and schools who use E-rate discounts or LSTA grants um, must install and employ filtering software on their computers. No library or school is required to accept these funds and a library can choose to forgo these funds to maintain local control of their internet use policy. However, if they do accept the money, it must certify every year that a technology protection measure is in use on its computers that, and, that, and the measure, technology protection measure has to block access to certain visual images on the internet. For adults, the filter must block access to visual images that are obscene or child pornography. And for minors under 17, the filter must prevent access to visual images that are obscene, child pornography, or what's called harmful to minors, that is, sexually themed materials that adults have a legal right to access but are deemed to lack any serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. SEPA does permit any person authorized by the library or school to disable or the filter or unblock a website for adult users to enable access for research or other lawful purposes. Note that the SEPA statute does not require that libraries filter text materials, controversial viewpoints or subjects, social media or search engines. Nor does SEPA authorize or require tracking of users' web surfing habits. In fact, the law itself explicitly bars such, such tracking. 
Now, in 2001, the American Library Association and other civil liberties groups joined with library users to file a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the Children's Internet Protection Act. After three years of litigation, a sharply divided Supreme Court issued a narrow plurality decision with several justices writing opinions. The court as a whole upheld the Children's Internet Protection Act, holding that the First Amendment does not prohibit Congress from requiring public libraries as a condition of receiving federal funding to use a technology pr protection measure, a filtering, uh, filtering software, to control what patrons and staff access online via library computers, as long as adults could request that the filters be disabled without needing to explain the request. Now, while the various opinions issued by the Supreme Court justices in the lawsuit op uh, offer different rationales for upholding the law, the one clear conclusion that can be drawn from all these opinions is that the ability of adult library users to gain access to constitutionally protected speech on the Internet is important to the constitutional use of Internet filters. Now, since the decision in US VALA, there have been three lawsuits that have challenged a public library's implementation of SEPA. The first, Bradburn versus North Central Regional Library District, ended when the federal district court ruled that it was the library's policy was reasonable and it ruled in part this uh, they ruled it reasonable in part because the branch libraries were small and there was no separation between the adult areas of the library and the children's areas of the library the second lawsuit p flag versus the camdenton school district found that it was unconstitutional for the school district to block access to content that was geared to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons and promoted gay rights uh, while allowing access to anti-gay sites. In the final lawsuit, the library settled this lawsuit, um, but they agreed to a court order that barred them from unconstitutionally blocking access to websites that discussed minority with religions like Wicca or paganism while allowing access to Christian-themed sites. Now, these three as-applied cases clearly indicate that while a library's filtering policy might be found to be reasonable, libraries do not enjoy unlimited discretion when filtering Internet content. The Camdenton and Hunter cases in particular demonstrate that libraries cannot employ filters to engage in unconstitutional practices as viewpoint discrimination or the deliberate suppression of ideas. But the core fact remains that for the last decade, public schools and public libraries have been required to filter their users' internet access in order to obtain federal subsidies for their purchase of internet connections. There's clear evidence that libraries and schools are denying access to controversial topics and to social media sites under SEPA. So much so that the FCC has now included cautionary language in its last rulemaking informing schools and libraries that sites like Facebook should not be regarded as harmful to minors and should be allowed through the filter. All this gives rise to certain critiques and concerns that raise broad <coughs> policy issues. First, SEPA as a law replaces the regu excuse me, uh, <clears throat> places regulation of disfavored internet content in the hands of private actors, third-party vendors who sell or provide internet filtering software to libraries and schools. So it is vendors, not librarians or teachers, who make the decisions about what content is filtered. Librarians and teachers are displaced and deprived of their traditional professional roles by software and IT professionals charged with administering the filter. And this vendor's decision making about what content to display and what content to censor is not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests or other transparency measures. There is no public accountability. Instead, the algorithms that make up a particular piece of software are treated as proprietary trade secrets. Vendors' decisions about what is filtered represents a form of speech regulation without any kind of meaningful check or balance. There's no due process available to challenge the filtering company's decisions, absent a lawsuit that targets the school or library itself that relies on the filtering software. Vendors the vendor's categories of content to be filtered is often subjective and reflects their personal biases and values. This is especially true of software marketed by companies and organizations with religious ties or explicitly religious missions. So the consequence is that schools and libraries often block much more content than SEPA requires. <coughs> Now, SEPA also legitimizes filtering and censorship as a means of resolving the controversy over minors' access to sexually-themed content. 
or anyone's access to content that is disfavored by the government. So it represents uh, a kind of shifting norm that we're seeing. We're seeing more proposals to manage issues like hacking, copyright infringement, cybercrime, and more by simply denying users access via use of the technology. And even as the US defends free internet freedoms for other countries, it is mandating that schools and libraries within its own borders use the same filtering software employed by repressive governments. And I find that this is generating a kind of disrespect for legal norms and, and ethical practices on the internet. Um, older youth openly seek to defeat school and library filters and often succeed. As a result, we're creating multiple generations of internet scoff laws. Now, CIFR is a legislative mandate that schools and libraries use software to undertake a task. CIFR uh, represents a legislative mandate that asks uh, software to do a task it cannot accomplish, distinguishing obscene images from other images. And none of the current methods used to filter content without human input, text or keyword analysis, link analysis, or IP address blockage, can filter without catching up large amounts of constitutionally protected content. So filtering software inevitably overblocks and underblocks constitutionally protected material, which is a violation of the First Amendment. However, this is a regime that we're, uh, libraries and schools must operate under at the current time. And so it's time that we examine what has happened in the last 10 years, what this has done to uh, information seeking in schools and libraries, and what it's meant for our communities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bob Holter, a former employee in the State Department of Public Instruction in Wisconsin. I retired last year from that particular position where I was a technology consultant working with schools and libraries on internet access issues, broadband, and e-rate program. Over the last few years, I've also assisted the ALA Office for Information Technology Policy in those particular areas as well, that is, internet, broadband, and e-rate uh, issues. This morning, Deborah gave just a very good background on CIPA and especially from the court point of view and some of the limitations on filters in relationship to what they can filter and what they can't filter, uh, especially the difficulty in filtering images that are covered by the law that are not deemed to be obscene. What I would like to do is take just a couple of minutes this morning and delve a little bit more specifically into what the law covers, what it does not cover, and some of the decision-making processes that libraries have to go through as they comply with CIPA, and include both libraries and schools. First of all, when CIPA was passed by Congress in late 2000, uh, the law dictated that the Federal Communications Commission had legal oversight over the Children's Internet Protection Act, and the FCC was then to develop rules and regulations on how to actually implement the act. I think from the library and school perspective, people have to realize the FCC gave a great deal of latitude within the constructs of the language itself on how it can be implemented. For example, there were a number of individuals that said the FCC should develop specific regulations on when and how the filter could be disabled, or there is a disabling uh, aspect or part of that language, and the FCC said it was not going to get into that, it was going to allow local libraries to make their own decisions on when and how and the process of disabling filters. Another recommendation that some groups had for the FCC was that the Federal Communications Commission should develop some type of filter certification process to have an official list of filters that would help or assist schools or libraries to comply with the law. Again, the FCC said that was for managing the filter process and they didn't want to get into establishing some type of national list of approved filter vendors or filtering products. I mention this in part because you do occasionally still see some uh, products that are out there by filtering companies saying that their product is uh, compliant with the Children's Internet Protection Act or will assist you in complying with the Act. But again, there is no filter certification process from the federal level, and you just have to take some of those comments somewhat with a grain of salt. A couple of other areas I do want to mention specifically is there is a major exemption in, in uh, CIPA that's uh, built right into the language of the law, and that is on the telecommunications side. What CIPA said is that if you get E-rate discounts for internet access, 
or for internal connections such as routers or servers or wiring inside the library building or school building you have to filter. But it did exempt telecommunication costs. And that includes voice telephony costs, that is dial tone, regular phone service, but it also includes broadband. And that broadband has become more and more important over the last four or five years. Uh, we think that's an important exemption so that in instances where you can separate broadband and the cost of broadband, for example, from internet service, uh, there are some libraries that will go ahead and get fee rate discounts on their broadband connectivity and elect not to get them, for example, on their internet access, which means in effect that they do not have to filter. The other important uh, piece that I would like to bring up this morning is the whole issue of penalties. There are people, and this came out in our symposium over the last day and a half, uh, that make decisions for schools and libraries that we think are uh, overly broad and that they filter far more information than they have to filter. As Deborah had said, the law specifically relates to, to uh, images that are obscene or uh, images that would fall under the definition of obscenity. You know, and also information that might be harmful to minors. But we're well aware of many schools and libraries that filter out far more than that. And part of the reason for doing this is fear that they're going to be sued, for example, fear that the federal government might sue them, fear that maybe some individual or individuals or organizations in their community might launch some type of lawsuit. So from a penalty perspective, it's important to note that there is no right of action for either the federal government or personal individuals or organizations to sue a school or library from non-compliance. At the most, if the FCC determines that a school or library has not complied with the Children's Internet Protection Act, they can take back the E-rate funding that that school or library has received during the time that they were in non-compliance. It is interesting to note in all of the years that SIPA has been in place since 2001, we are not aware of any instances in which the FCC has taken that onerous action against schools or libraries. So I do want to bring this out that, yes, there is a penalty. We feel it is a fairly minor penalty, if you will, and up until this point in time, it really has never been uh, enacted as far as any school or library noncompliance issue. One other thing I want to bring up is that the world obviously has changed considerably since the passage of SIPA and its implementation in 2001. And that is in relationship to uh, schools, particularly on uh, students bringing in their own devices, handheld devices, maybe laptops, tablets, for example, smartphones. Same thing from the library perspective. When you look at the language in SIPA, it specifically refers to a school or library's computers or its computers. And when you look within the context of the law, the pronoun its clearly refers to computers that are owned by the school or library. So it has always been ALA's position that a uh, patron, for example, coming into the library with his or her laptop and connecting into the library's Wi-Fi, internet access, that that lot, laptop does not, under the law, have to be filtered. You might have a local policy that says it has to be filtered, but it doesn't have to be filtered by the law. Of interest, uh, this has become, of course, a little bit more complicated than I noted before, especially from the school perspective with a lot of students bringing in their own devices. And a number of groups, including the ALA UA Task Force and the State UA Coordinators Alliance that represents the K-12 community, have asked the FCC for more guidance on this area about devices owned by students, so devices maybe taken home, uh, borrowed from the <laughs> library. And when the FCC just last week released its UA reform notice, it had a couple of paragraphs in there seeking comments from the school and library community on how it should interpret some of the CIPA language in relationship to students owning their own devices, or in the case of libraries, maybe owning devices and loaning them out to patrons to take at home, when filters should apply and should not apply in those particular instances. So the technology changes, the law has remained the same. If you get into some of these areas that I just noted that there's some gray areas in which the FCC still has to release more rules and regulations and provide more guidance uh, as our world changes and we all move to uh, internet connectivity, especially through handheld and mobile devices. So I think that's the comments that I have this morning, and I'll turn the program back over to Mariko. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Houghton. I'm the director for the San Rafael Public Library. Um, my former job was working for the San Jose Public Library, and I had occasion to do quite a bit of research on internet filters, how they worked when I worked there, and have continued the research on my own time since. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how filters work or don't work, how effective they are, and then how to get around them. So there are dozens of major filtering products at multiple price points. Uh, what we find looking at different libraries is that they implement a wide range of different filtering products depending on what they can afford. Um, these are extremely configurable on the more expensive end and not very configurable at all on the cheaper end. The, the problem that was mentioned before is that these products are largely black boxes, so you don't really know what's being blocked, what's on the black lists or the naughty lists, if you will, what has been put into each category, what criteria were used to put things into different categories, whether they're being spot checked by a human, who that human is, what qualifications they have. Uh, most of the time it's someone earning a relatively low salary, uh, without any kind of a, an information degree uh, who's an, analyzing whether or not these, um, these sites fit into the naughty list or not. Um, a lot of the categories are problematic, such as the category of alternative lifestyles. That might mean one thing to one person and something different to someone else. And some between filtering products, you'll see different things placed in that category. So there are four major ways that, that filters work. Uh, today. Uh, one is blocking things based on web addresses or IP addresses, basically blacklists of sites that are, are deemed to be inappropriate in whatever category uh, we might be talking about, whether it's sexually explicit material, uh, hate speech, you name it. Uh, another way that the filters work is keyword analysis, so they'll search for hot words or combinations of hot words, and most of the different filtering products use Google almost exclusively, so they'll run a search for something naughty like sexy videos, and whatever the top 100 results are for that will get blacklisted automatically. And again, sometimes these results are spot checked by humans, sometimes not. Uh, the third way that these filtering products work is by link analysis. So the, the sites will look at who else the site is linking to, uh, how many links are on each page, words in the links, whether there are a large number of characters and numbers in the links, uh, and then that is used as part of the formula of deciding whether or not the site is, is bad or not. And then finally, for image and video filtering, there's been a more recent, in the last several years, development of looking at different ways to, to specifically address uh, images and moving images through pixel analysis, so looking at the percentage of pixels in an image that are of quote-unquote skin tone, shape analysis, so looking about what body part it is that's being displayed, if it looks like a body part, is shaped like a body part, faces are okay, uh, genitals are not okay, according to most of these, these algorithms. Um, and all of those things that I just listed are used in varying degrees depending on the product that you're using and, again, how expensive it is and how sophisticated it is. And when we're talking about efficacy rates of different filtering products, the analysis of, that has been done multiple studies over the years, uh, looking back, more or less, depending on, on which study you're looking at, the general number is that they're about 80% effective for websites or for text analysis, keyword or, or hot word analysis. Uh, and a less than 50% accurate for images and video. And I just want to reiterate that, less than 50%. So you have a better chance of successfully filtering image or video by flipping a coin than by trusting the filtering product to do it for you. All of these products both overblock and underblock, meaning that they let things through that shouldn't be let through according to the configurer, the user's definition of what's okay. And um, they also uh, over, I'm sorry, that was underblocking, and they overblock in terms of Protecting, uh, protected constitutionally uh, okay uh, material is, is not allowed through. And both of those things happen. So uh, the question to ask is whether or not we're okay using products that make the wrong decision at least 20% of the time, uh, more if we're talking about images or video. And we're not just talking about kids, we're talking about people of all ages in public libraries, not just school libraries, different socioeconomic levels and differ different levels of technical proficiency. So how do you get around filters? Well, it's not very difficult. It's extraordinarily easy, in fact. There are sites like Peacefire and others who are just dedicated to building resource lists of how to get around different filters, different strategies, um, including things like proxy servers or proxy sites like Siphon and Stupid Censorship. And there are new proxy sites springing up all the time as the old ones get put on the naughty list. Um, there are really easy ways to beat IP or web address analysis uh, by using IP referrers or mirror sites, and a lot of the sites that are blocked use these techniques in order to get their content through. 
some things you can do as an individual. If you run a web search, you can click on the cached version of a site. And almost always, you can look at that. You just can't look at the live version of the site that is blocked. You can misspell words. So if you think how someone might misspell something, have a typo in a word, um, spell it phonetically, oftentimes searching for words that way, you'll be able to pull results up that are otherwise blocked. Filters are also extremely English-centric. And so if you search for terms in almost any other language, you'll be able to bring up any number of different results in the sites that would normally be, be blocked or quote unquote should be blocked under the filters definition. Um, there are a couple of filters that do filter out other languages on, on demand through their own little dictionaries of that language. Uh, but most of them are still very English-centric. So that's an extremely easy way for many of our bilingual users to get around filters. Another thing is use a search engine other than Google to, to search for something in particular. So use something like DuckDuckGo, Yahoo, or um, stealing cat forbid, Bing. Uh, and you'll be able to pull up a different set of results that Google did. And most of those sites will be allowed through if they didn't show up on the Google list. Adult content site providers um, also have started to try to work around filters limits. So they limit the number of links so that they'll be below the thresholds of the major filters and filtering software. Um, they purposely have no or very bad metadata surrounding their content so that it won't be triggering the filters. And they also tend to misspell words in titles uh, or any other metadata they do attribute to the content so that they can get around the filters. Um, another problem with the image and video filtering that we're seeing of late is that different skin tones don't resonate within the, the analysis of what quote unquote skin tone is. So if you're very light, or dark-skinned, you don't show up as being skin toned. And so those images are, are shown through. Um, if you're too furry, that lets you, it goes through as well. You can change the filter or the hue settings on an image or a video, make everybody blue or purple, and all of a sudden that gets let through. Uh, and it also, um, because it does, a lot of these software programs are trying to be sophisticated and say, oh, well, if it's a, a baby smiling, we'll let that through. So if you draw a face uh, above genitals or you hold a photo of a baby above genitals and then take a video or a photo of that, that gets let through. So in other words, there are many, many ways to get around the filters. And the people who want to get this content have figured all of these things out uh, and are getting around them uh, in, in libraries and in schools where these filters have been implemented. Um, but again, the end result to me is really going back and looking at those efficacy rates and whether or not 80% or less success rate is something that's acceptable to us uh, or not. Uh, and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. All right. So hi, folks. This is Martin Garner. I am a reference services librarian at Regis University in Denver, Colorado. And I am the chair of the ALA Committee on Professional Ethics. And my job is to give you a recap uh, of part of the conversation that we had at the symposium yesterday. So um, don't look at the people behind the curtain. Uh, no, see, I forgot, got one laugh. All right, so um, after all the discussion about filtering, um, we uh, had a rather uh, lively discussion about whether it was really possible to create a truly SIPA compliant filter. And if I say SIPA, I mean the same thing, tomato, tomato, so forgive me if that happens. Um, that would really just block what's required under the law. Uh, making it transparent, making it open source so that people could see what's being blocked because a lot of the concerns is that with the proprietary filters that are out there, we don't know how decisions are being made. Uh, ultimately, this idea was rejected about uh, because it was about as realistic as a rainbow producing unicorn. Um, though we did come up with the unicorn filter as a concept. So if anyone can build the unicorn filter, please let us know. Uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, was also discussed as part of this, and, and that kind of morphed into a discussion of how filters could be, uh, filter testing could be crowdsourced, and we could at least try to advise uh, uh, each other on how uh, different filters are working or not working, um, and just trying to get a sense of, of how to almost re uh, reverse engineer them um, as best as we could. Um, in the absence of the unicorn filter, we shifted more to a, a focus on a discussion about education. And so uh, education uh, takes a number of different meanings here, um, that educating our children and youth to be the best filters that they can be by having it be in their head, that they know uh, for themselves what they should and shouldn't be looking at. It's something that their parents can and should talk to them about, but that they can just block it and, and say, oh, I don't want to see that, and go to another page. Um, Another education component 
is uh, educating librarians about the exact requirements of the law. Uh, Bob had previously mentioned some uh, concerns about uh, turning on too many settings, uh, trying to uh, protect the library from uh, litigation, if you will, from other concerns from angry parents and uh, really needing to educate our colleagues about what is required under the law, that we, we, we want to follow what we have to do, but we don't need to overreach. Um, another education realm is educating decision makers. Uh, oftentimes we recognize that it's not the librarians who are making decisions about what to filter, uh, how to implement these devices. And so it's uh, working with our colleagues in technology, it's working with our administrators, uh, and uh, making them understand what we have to do and trying to uh, figure out what would be convincing to make it more uh, following the law. Uh, this then shifted to then, well, how do we get this message out and, and what sort of information do we need to get out there? And there was acknowledgement that the American Library Association has already done a lot of work in uh, putting this information together and we, we've had it for years, in fact. It's just that we're not good about getting the message out. And so we will be uh, talking more uh, in the second hangout about uh, a little bit about the messaging. Um, we also talked about uh, the need to develop a clearinghouse. And again, there'll be more on that in, in the second half. Uh, but to try to pull together the information that we have and to create a place where we can share more information uh, about what we know uh, to perhaps you know build up best practices and try to share the research uh, and not just the anecdotes that we have about how filters have been not working the way that they were intended uh, and how they've been blocking research how they've been uh, interfering with education but to actually get some uh, some some good hard facts and some data that we can then use uh, to explore ways to change the situation um, that covers most of my notes though I'm sure we'll have a few other things that will pop up uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Catherine. That's why I was looking that way, for those of you who are following us. She's over there. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Dice, content strategist for the Association of College and Research Libraries at ALA. And I'm the moderator for this panel and uh, will be for uh, Google Hangout 2, which follows this one at 12.15 Eastern Time. Uh, no, one, twelve fifteen Eastern Time. Sorry. So um, I I have a couple of questions for the panelists right now. So uh, I'll just uh, put these out there. We're, we're taking questions on uh, the YouTube comment uh, channel as well as um, from Twitter. So please uh, let us know if you have questions or want to comment on what you've been hearing so far. Um, I would like to pose a question to either Bob or Barbara. Um, if there's no legal recourse. Uh, federal legal recourse um, ag against a library. What what kinds of issues do librarians need to be concerned about then? In terms of of it changes the term compliance, doesn't it? If there's no legal recourse. Oh, when you say legal recourse, what do you mean? Um, when when Bob said that the federal government does not have the uh, authority to sue. No, no, there, there, no, well, there's no private right of action under CEPA, so an individual citizen cannot use. Oh. Excuse me, folks, if you can hear me. Um, there, there's no private right of action under CEPA for individual citizens, so uh, individuals can't sue the local library for not complying with CEPA in a way that they don't like. Um, but the federal government itself is bound by the terms of the law, and we should realize that CEPA is an administrative law. Um, and there's, there's no, no criminal, criminal uh, uh, enforcement attached to it. So, so what the libraries have to be concerned about is following the FCC's rules for, um, um, for filing the necessary certifications under the rulemaking um, and ensuring that the filter is in place. Now, if the FCC finds out that the filter is not in place or that they haven't been filing their certifications and paperwork in the proper manner, the FCC can say, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to do under CEPA, give us our money back. And that's the only penalty that Congress put into the law. So there is, you know, the FCC does have legal recourse. It's just that the legal recourse is asking for a refund of the monies the library received or the school received under CEPA. Thank you. 
And, and I, I think, think as, as I had mentioned before, before yeah, the fact that, that the FCC, FCC has never done that to our knowledge is an indication from my perspective anyway that if a school or library is taking a good faith effort to comply with the law, I think their chances of getting penalized by the FCC are pretty much non-existent. And, um, and it should be noted too that the law specifically provides um, for an opportunity to cure the mistake. So often, the few times that we have heard about issues, the FCC has contacted the library or school and said, you know, you have six months to get everything fixed. Fix your paperwork, fix, uh, get the filter in place, whatever the problem was. And then usually they don't ask for the money back once they fix the mistake. So it, it's very much a guidance situation, an administrative agency enforcement, not a criminal law enforcement, not a civil law enforcement situation. Um, we have a question from the from the audience. Um, the question is: Are schools required to filter sites like YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest for teachers as well as students to get E-rate? Um, SEPA does not require uh, schools or libraries to filter any social media at all um, for students or for teachers. Um, in fact, the FCC has issued guidance. Uh, in a rulemaking telling schools and libraries that they should not regard social media platforms as inherently harmful to minors and that they should allow access. That the concern and so that uh, libraries and schools that are filtering social media are doing so as part of local policy not by any legal requirement imposed by SEPA. And this is Bob. Uh, one thing I do want to mention and we used to get quite a few questions on this, not quite as many now is that SIPA um, does require that all of the school and library PCs that are connected to the internet be filtered and that includes staff PCs as well as patron PCs or student PCs. But again there is that uh, caveat language in SIPA that says adults or library staff or school staff can unfilter for adult use. So I think it could be fairly easy for a school or library to craft a policy that would allow teachers or library staff to have unfiltered access and still comply with the law. Thank you, uh, Bob and, and Deb. Um, Sarah, have there been any conversations uh, with filtering vendors regarding the efficacy of these this this problem efficacy and, and what is their stance on on, on the problems? <laughs> Uh, the conversations that I've had with the filtering companies, both during my formal research and then afterward, um, a, a lot of them will tout their product is 99% effective. Uh, and sometimes, depending on how they're rating it, they may be somewhere in the eight, high 80s to low 90s for uh, blocking, quote unquote, inappropriate content. But their over blocking is so high, in other words, they let so many, uh, they block so many sites that are constitutionally protected that should be allowed through, that that undoes that percentage rating and kicks them back down to the 80% average. Um, the more people block, the, the better they are at blocking, the more they tend to overblock. Uh, and most often the numbers that they report out to consumers or advertise in their marketing materials are simply, how good are we at blocking the top thousand sites that are deemed to be obscene or harmful to minors by their definition, which they don't really share with us, and we don't know what's on the list, and we don't know how it's configured. Um, they, When I've talked to them about enhancements to products or why is the image filtering success rate so low, uh, they will say things like, well, most of the bad images are hosted on bad sites, so they'll just be blocked anyway. But again, there are so many ways to get around that by going to a cached version or doing image searches in, in engines other than Google. Um, there, there are just so many ways to work around them that when you start talking to the filtering companies, and you have to talk to the engineers, not to the salespeople, uh, you often find that they haven't really thought about all the ways to break their product, um, and that those of us who are on the ground or talking to people who are trying to break the products uh, have come up with much more creative solutions to working around their product than, than they have internally in terms of R&D. There's also, from what I can tell from talking to the companies, a lot of, not a lot of R&D money going into improving these products, improving the algorithms, improving the strategies that they use to effectively block the quote-unquote bad stuff and let the quote-unquote good stuff through. Uh, so we're still 
functionally operating with technology that's five to ten years old, depending on the, the company that you're looking at. Um, so I think in a lot of cases it's a question of asking the right questions of the vendors, of really getting in there and testing the products before implementing them. And then if you have to have them in place, configuring them to the bare minimum settings in order to be CEPA requirements so that you're not in danger of overblocking things you don't want to block. Thanks, Sarah. Um, there's another question here. Um, how has how and for Martin, how have changes in technology over the past ten years um, changed how we we want to approach or think about SIPA and its requirements? So uh, one of the challenges I find with any technology related law is that it's uh, it can't really predict what's going to happen and does not understand how uh, we might be using technology in the future. And so, uh, again, when we're, we're in a, a society that is so now risk averse that uh, by over implementing filters in schools, uh, especially, we're not seeing, and I, I shouldn't be looking to Catherine, sorry guys, uh, we we are not uh, anticipating the ways that technology could be used and we are seeing schools that block the use of Google Docs or all the social media platforms and other ways that they can share and create content. Uh, and that is such uh, a way, an important way uh, to educate our ourselves, uh, students, adults, whoever, um, about uh, the, the creation process of sharing knowledge. It's not just a one-way transmission the way it was when uh, this uh, law was really thought about, but now we're truly using the internet to uh, not just receive information, but to share the information that we want to get out there. And so I think that the big issue uh, is that we are uh, basically chaining ourselves to the past in terms of what we could do with technology, and we are not then creating people, uh, whether it's students or adults who are coming back to public libraries and trying to uh, retool themselves for a new career or a new job, uh, we're not creating people who can then compete uh, and who cannot fully express themselves. So I think that's, that's what I have to say about that. Do any of the other panelists have comments uh, um, about this technology evolution question? Um, I'm willing to cede the, the mic to someone here. Just to let me know. Raise your hand if you, Bob. But, um, go ahead, Bob. Uh, I had mentioned as part of my presentation just a few minutes ago that the Federal Communications Commission is seeking guidance on the whole issue of tablets, uh, smartphones, and whether they need to be filtered or not. It's of interest to note that most schools and libraries now are filtering at some level within a network sort of environment. So generally if a patron would come in with a laptop and connect to the library's network, there's a good chance that that laptop is going to be filtered. It's not that the filter is physically software located on the laptop, but the type of internet connectivity is coming in through the library's uh, filtered network environment. Whereas back 10 or 11 years ago, when we were dealing with laptops, not too many the libraries had Wi-Fi access at that point in time, but in many instances they didn't really filter at that particular level. So there was concern about libraries having to actually install filters on Patreon. Uh, workstations and patron laptops, and again, the technology has just moved in a, a quite a different direction from that perspective. But I think that we all want to stay away from requiring, for example, by the law or by FCC fiat, that privately owned devices, be it a, uh, a tablet that a student might own or a laptop or a tablet, for example, that a patron might own in the library, have to be uh, filtered under the law. Again, it could be a policy situation, it could be just the way the network is set up that almost by default these particular devices will be filtered, but we want to stay away from a mandate that they come under SIPA from that perspective. Thanks, Bob. Um, we have uh, another question. Um, and and it's uh, isn't it's from Safe Libraries. Isn't li uh, over blocking minuscule compared to the deep web that hides seven eighths of the internet? Uh, and libraries don't help with that. Uh, Sarah, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, 
the deep web is still accessible. It's just a question of digging it out and being able to find it. And librarians are professionally trained in research to help people find exactly that type of information. However, when you're implementing a software P, uh, product that simply blocks access to something that you cannot get, whether it's on the open web, the deep web, or wherever, that's an entirely different matter than it just being difficult to find. So I think those two are not comparable at all. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, we have another question. Is there anything legally preventing a library accepting E-rate funds and filtering from also giving information to patrons on how to get around the filters? Uh, Deborah? Um, actually, um, by the plain language of the law and the rulemaking, there's nothing preventing libraries from providing that information to users at all. Um, so if a library, somebody has a reference question and asks that and the library is equipped to answer that question, there, there's nothing legally uh, preventing them from doing that. Is, uh, oops. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Um, there, there's a question also about what are the uh, qualitative differences between the application of SIPA in public libraries versus school libraries. And we know that these are two different universes. So um, I'll open the floor here to somebody to grab the mic. OK. Uh, well, in public libraries, uh, adults have the right to ask for something to be unblocked. And it should be as seamless and painless as possible. So I think that would be one, one difference that um, we're dealing with adults um, and teens, people of all ages in public libraries. Uh, whereas in school libraries, we're primarily dealing with, with youth. Um, so I think the, the application and the implications for those, those very different groups uh, are important to take note of. Um, and I'll cede the floor to anyone else who wants to speak more to that. Uh, this is Bob, and I'll just make a couple of quick comments. This is a, at a very general, somewhat 30,000 foot level, but you know, in a library environment, we are very much concerned about patron privacy. And last time I checked, I think 48, 48 out of 50 states had privacy laws that protected the circulation of print materials. In a number of states, including my native state of Wisconsin, we've also interpreted the law that it protects internet access and where people go and what they do as well. So. In a general sense, libraries don't necessarily want to know what patrons are doing, again, within certain confines. I think from the school perspective, it's quite different than that, in part simply because they're dealing with minors for the most part. Schools do have a much more vested interest in not necessarily controlling, but having a little bit more oversight on what's happening in relationship to internet access in their environment than does the public library. Uh, but let me add to that that the statute itself forbids tracking of individual internet use. Um, it's section two of the law. And so that, uh, and there has been guidance from the Department of Education, I believe, on this point. But so when the law talks about monitoring student use of the internet under SEPA, it's not talking about key logging or following um, web histories or anything like that. What they're saying is that they expect the teachers and librarians in the school to supervise the students' internet use and to be aware of what they're doing and not um, individually tracking their use at all. So that there is some measure of privacy for students even though um, the school is uh, operating under SEPA. Um, and I will note that even uh, in some states, the, the library confidentiality law extends to students as well. So there is even a duty to protect the students' web surfing habits under the, the, in those states. As well. And there's uh, a good grand majority of them do include school libraries under the protection. Um, there's another question here uh, that relates to one of the outcomes of this symposium, and that has to do with research. Uh, uh, the, the question from the audience is, has, have there been any research studies since 1998 on, on the efficacy of filters and on filtering? I'll take that one. Uh, yes, a ton of them. Uh, there have been about a dozen um, what I would call major or moderate studies that have been done uh, from 2001 on. 
Um, and they all seem to show pretty much the same success rates or efficacy rates of filters. Uh, I, there's a, a, a large table of them included with some material published on the San Jose Public Library's website about our filtering study. Um, I've got it on my website. I'm happy to post it again for people later. Um, but they basically all show the same thing. Um, it doesn't matter what products you're testing. I mean, EU, the EU did some research, the Australian Communications and Media Authority. You've got individuals doing research, whether it's for the Department of Justice, for the ACLU, for specific library districts. You have vendors testing their own products and still coming up with the same exact numbers everybody else comes up with. Uh, so there have been a lot of studies done. And again, the consistency in the results shows me that there's that these are accurate, that this isn't someone with an agenda one way or the other trying to prove whether something works or not, that you are, in general, going to have only about 80% effectiveness with, with a filter. Thanks, Sarah. Um, there's another question here about uh, filtering other groups. Um, uh, that uh, GLD, GLBT um, came up. As a, as a case, and, and the question is, are there cases of filtering specific groups, targeting specific groups beyond uh, a generic children or, you know, kind of? Um, this is Dr. Stone. Stone. I'll take, I'll take it. it. Um, what we do know, because of a number of uh, investigations by the ACLU, they had a project called Don't Filter Me that uh, sought information about filtering that targeted GLBT websites. Um, that, in fact, there are a, uh, a number of commercial filters out there that had categories that specifically targeted GLBT positive information. Sometimes they categorized it as alternative lifestyles. Sometimes they actually had a category called LGBT concerns. And um, when the filtering company provided the filter to the school, um, they would tick off these boxes in the belief that that was somehow harmful to minors. This has actually been litigated in the courts. Uh, I referenced this in my introduction about the Camdenton decision where um, the federal court who reviewed this kind of use of filtering found that it was unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination under the First Amendment. Um, the school in that case uh, ended up paying $125,000 in legal fees to the ACLU and is still operating under a consent order to, uh, and, had, and has to have its filtering reviewed by the courts. So it's a cautionary tale to be very aware of what your filter is blocking because you could be unaware that your filtering company has set you up with this kind of filtering if you're a library or school and it opens you up to a lawsuit for unconstitutional filtering. Um, that, that leads nicely into um, a question we have from the audience. Um, aren't public funds to purchase filtering software, commercial filtering software via E-Rate and LSTA? If so, would the specifications used by that software be subject to FOIA request despite its proprietary trade secret status? Uh, could that potentially lead to an as-applied challenge? Barbara? Um, actually, um, the, the interesting thing about SEPA, it's, called an, uh, it's what's called an unfunded mandate. There's no funds provided to the libraries to buy the filters. This is why many libraries find it's too expensive to actually accept E-rate. Um, E-rate is calculated based on the level of poverty in a community, um, often measured by the number of free school lunches that is given away. And there are many school libraries in communities that are wealthy. And they find that by the time they buy the filter and they staff up to, uh, to um, work with the filter and everything like that, it will cost them far more money to accept E-rate than the benefit they'll get from the E-rate discount itself. Um, so there's no way of uh, getting at the filters because uh, the filters are being paid for by federal funds because, in fact, they're not being paid for by federal funds. Um, the, it, and this is a tricky question because we're talking about private actors here. You know, there's nothing that uh, a private corporation is not subject to FOIA. And if the library itself is not holding the information, they have no information to turn over to you under a FOIA request. Um, and it's one of the f issues that, one of the reasons I raise that as an issue. You know, there's always a question when the government delegates its 
uh, authorities to a private actor. And so um, it's a policy issue that we must, we should be discussing and exploring. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's been cause for the government, uh, for court ordering the government to start, stop delegating its uh, activity to a private actor, but that hasn't occurred here yet. Um, Catherine, I'll just quickly add, there's nothing in the civil language itself that precludes the use of E-rate funds to pay for the filtering software, but the FCC just made that decision on an administrative basis. Of interest, what I mentioned as part of my presentation, the FCC released that E-rate reform notice last week, and there were a number of questions about uh, filtering on bringing your own devices, et cetera, that I covered. They also did ask, should we, the FCC, reconsider our policy of not allowing E-rate funds to be used to pay for filtering? So. They are seeking comments on that the whole issue of paying for it with the use of e rate funds. Thank you. Um, uh, switching gears here for a second, Martin, um, as an LIS educator, how do you talk with your students about um, this kind of, of technology and requirement um, when you're preparing them to enter uh, the world of? of directing libraries or making decisions in libraries, both about budgets and financial health of the library, but about um, following the mission of the library and the values, the fundamental values of librarianship and, and information science. So um, I, I teach uh, an ethics class, and um, it'll probably give it away to the students when I talk about filtering under the censorship week. Um, as to where I stand on things. Um, and I do like to ask them, first of all, what they think, uh, what they know uh, about um, CIPA and its requirements. And many of them work in libraries and, and say, oh, uh, and start listing all these things that they think it, it has to do, and, and they, they just don't know. And I guess that's why they're in school. And so um, I, going forward, will now make all of my students read uh, Deborah Stone's excellent article that was in American Libraries that uh, really lays that out clearly. Um, I, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard because uh, students do struggle with uh, the same things that we struggle with in terms of wanting to uh, see that there's a way to protect children from things that they shouldn't see, and yet they see the the burden that filters can uh, theoretically place on uh, all types of users. Um, and I, I think that the approach that I will be focusing on more in the future is to look at the, the harmful effects of uh, filtering and how it really damages students' abilities to make good decisions um, and that that does interfere with the mission of the library to provide access uh, to information and, and to how, to how to consume that information uh, in a way that will be helpful. And so. Um, trying to focus on the educational role of the library and how filters just interfere with that uh, and hoping to encourage any of the future directors out there that they choose a path where the, they do not have to install this in their library. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, following the desires of our audience, um, uh, there's a question here that I'd like to direct to Barbara. Uh, for SIPA compliance, may uh, library directors and patrons unblock internet filters for themselves? Um, well, the, the language of the law says that um, it may be unblocked by uh, anyone authorized by the library or school uh, authority to do so. And so it's perfectly possible for the library to authorize its users to unblock the filter if they're an adult over the age of 17. And so there are some libraries that have actually keyed um, internet access to library cards. And so when, the, uh, so when they sign up for the library card, they indicate whether they want to be, have their filter unblocked. And so when they uh, log in, the computer recognizes that and provide, uh, disables the filter on their request, as the law provides. Thank you very much. Um, we are... Uh, at the closing of this um, Hangout, we are going to be reconvening to talk about next steps and some of the other results uh, for, of our conversations in the symposium yesterday. Uh, please join us at uh, 1210. We'll be pushing out the link to that Hangout. At 1215, we will begin. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, in this first uh, Google Hangout about the SIPA uh, symposium 10 years later. <laughs>